discover the career of your dreams, learn how to get your foot in the door, stand out, and create the life you desire. This is our time. This is our adventure. Together, you and I will explore the world, discover what's possible, and eradicate wasted potential from existence. I'm Siobhan Colleen. This is Industry Explorers. Welcome to Industry Explorers, the podcast that's all about discovering the world and discovering who you want to be. I'm your host, Siobhan Colleen, and today's guest is an ex-Army interrogator who was able to escape escape foster care. But that's pretty much what you did is I was listening to another podcast and you're like, I wanted to get the hell out of there. And they offered me 10 grand to be an interrogator. So that was gold for a kid in high school. So there you go. Off I went. <laughs> Roman, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. You're exactly right. I love the free roll intro because really and truly, that's probably that's probably the best description I've had of getting out of foster care. It was an escape. Like I escaped to join the military and then I tried to escape from the life that I had. And then I escaped into my work and found my passion in business consulting and business analytics. So yeah, a lot of it was escaping and running. So you, you hit the nail on the head. Well, we're definitely going to take a lot, like a huge deep dive into all of that stuff. So my first question that I ask all my guests, when you were in high school, what did you want to do upon graduation? I wanted to join the military. I knew from a very early age I wanted to be in the military. How early? So I will say when I was a little kid in foster care, I was always constantly fighting bad guys and trying to keep like evil away, right? I think that was kind of like a subconscious escape for me. Then when I got adopted into a home, that home, my grandpa was in World War II. I watched a lot of war movies growing up, a lot of John Wayne storming the beaches and things like that. Um, and I always just saw brotherhood and camaraderie. So I really think as early as I can remember, I wanted to. And then, like I said, the military was an escape, right? So as I got into high school, they were basically saying, hey, you could go to college, but you might owe money, right? And so that means I might be indebted to the family that I was with, or I could join the military and kind of make it make my own way. And so I'm a very anti-authority person anyways, so I chose to go my own way. Now, even though you say you were anti-authority, you describe your basic training experience as just kind of going with the flow because when the purpose of basic training is to break you down as a person and then rebuild you into like a good little soldier for lack of a better phrase. But you came from such a traumatized past that it was almost like you went in already broken down. All you were doing in basic training was just building up. Yeah. Yeah. I just needed an identity, right? I didn't have one. Um, I was just whatever people wanted me to be. So basic was super easy for me, right? Just sit down, keep your head down, do that. And then it kind of gave me the identity of soldier. Then I got trained in interrogation. And it was really when I became an interrogator that I started kind of to be anti-authority because I got to work with special operations. I got to be with these kind of larger than life people. And the common theme was you, you think the military is very rank and file. And it is, right? I'm not going to say that there isn't discipline or structure. And I'm not going to say I don't appreciate that. I did. But this whole like follow orders mindlessly thing is not true. There's a thought pattern to it. Like, does this make sense? Is this logical? Is this going to hurt me and my friends, right? So so there's a lot more to it than just do what you're told. Now, there are definitely instances, right, where there's not enough time to think something out, right? And, a, and an NCO looks at you as fire's coming in and says, hey, go over there. And you do because you trust that person, right? So I think the the more accurate depiction of the good little soldier is you learn when to be a good little soldier. You learn that there's a time to just take orders and listen, but there's also a time to think through something. And is this the right response? Is this what I need to do? Is this what I should be doing? Right. And, and I think that's really how it, how it went for me and where I really started to learn. It's okay to be open about what you agree and disagree with. Right. Um, but still my underlying issue was to kind of conform to people. So even inside of that, I would still try to do it in very non-aggressive ways and, Hey, hold on. Are we okay? You know, and try to be very relaxed about it. Now I'm just like, yo, I don't want to do that. I don't agree with that. And here's why you can either like it or dislike it. It sounds like there is a time and a place to challenge authority, but uh, just like that, there's also a time and place where that is not like, that is not appropriate. If you're getting, if you're under fire, Right. If you're in Iraq and you're storming a house and like shit hits the fan real quick, as I understand from 
stories that other veterans tell. So I really appreciate you already, like within the first 10 minutes of this podcast, breaking down a common stigma that people have, a common misconception that people have towards people in the military. I almost joined the military myself. So I I completely appreciate what you say. So you went in as a human intelligence collector. What inspired that? Yes. So, I mean, like I said, I wanted to join and I I knew that I wanted. So here's the other misconception I'm going to just spell about the military. Not everybody is a gunfighter, right? Like you watch all these movies and you see gunfighters and you see this crazy stuff where you play Call of Duty and you're like, I want to be that, right? Like there's a lot more to the military than that. So when I joined the military, I said exactly the same thing. Like I want to be that because that's all I knew. But there's tons of jobs, whether you want to be in technology, computers, legal, um, supply, you know, logistical movements, right? Like all these different things. There's tons of it, right? And then there's analytics, intelligence, all these different things. So, so for me, I didn't know what I, I knew I wanted to be in the military. I didn't know much else than that. People jokingly say like, man, you, you must be an interior, uh, a recruiter's wet dream. And I really was because they could literally do whatever, like they could have said whatever. And at that time, I think I joined at the right time because I scored well on the aptitude for interrogator, but there was also a need for interrogators. So because I scored well and because there was a need, I got selected for it and I and I did it. I got an extra paycheck. So I picked interrogator because they gave me $10,000. But truthfully, everything growing up had prepared me to be an interrogator. So it was really the perfect culmination. And I call it divine intervention, right? Like God had a big part in that. And even at the time where I wasn't really seeing him, he was seeing me and had a plan. And so that that's kind of how I see it. I think that is beautiful. People have this misconception that you only join the military if you are not made for college or if you're essentially a loser in life. Like if you are just like not the smartest person or if you come from like a low socioeconomic status, that's who joins the military. But that's that's far from true. Yeah. At, in your own story, the military was an excellent escape for you and it helped you move into the different areas of your life that you're currently in. But you mentioned there's so many different jobs available in the military, such as legal, such as medical, such as logistics and all of this different stuff. And when you break it down, if you don't do the military path, in order to get to those jobs, you have to go to college or you have to do a trade. And the cool thing about the military is there's a lot of financial assistance if you want to do college afterwards or during your your enlistment. Or if you're a reservist and you do the reserves and then go to college simultaneously, there's so many different options available. And it's not, we definitely need to get rid of that stigma that it's like, if you're not smart, you go into the military because there's nothing else out in the world. Like that's, fuck that. That's not true. Yeah, it's crazy. So I will actually tell you like one of the teams I worked with. So I worked with a a MARSOC team, which is Marine Special Operations. And there's a lot of jokes and and I'll tell the jokes too, right? Like I'm all about giving other branches shit, but um. The, you know, they'll say like Marines are crayon eaters or they're not intelligent or they just know how to like shoot, shoot guns. Right. And these dudes did. But I worked with a team where the team chief had a master's degree in like historical arts. The me- there was a doctor, like a legit doctor. He had a medical degree and he was a Navy corpsman. Right. So there were two two guys with masters in like philosophy. Right. A per, uh, a, he was an analyst, but he has a master's in mathematics. Right. So so like th- these guys were geniuses in, in really and truly like there's no other way to say it. And they were also highly technical, highly technical and very proficient at, at their military job. Right. So they were also, you know, door kickers. They, they had most of them had been to you know, an airborne school or a, a helo school or some form of advanced training inside the military, not including the special operations course they went through. Right. So I was setting beside some of the smartest people I've ever been around in the, in the world, you know, and, and we were traveling the world. So they like knew the history of Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria or wherever, like, because they weren't these like, ignorant, you know, redneck hillbillies that people think the military is. I, you know, I, I thousand percent agree with you. Like that stigma has to leave. And yeah, there's just like anywhere else, there's bad apples, you know, like I'm not going to say there aren't, but I was blessed to get to work around a lot of amazing people. I mean, there's a warrant officer who's still a great friend of mine. He just pinned on CW5 and he was a teacher 
before he joined the military. Like, had a career as an educator. His wife is like a, a pharmaceutical. Like, she has a bachelor's and master's in medicine and works in like pharmaceutical, right? So, so I mean, these are not just your, I don't know, ignorant people, I guess, is really kind of the, or no other option. Now, for me, they're definitely what, like, I, I did well in school, but I knew that I was going to owe people money and I didn't want that. And that I wanted, like I said, to be on my own. And so that's why I joined the military. But truly, yeah, there were very few, as far as my field, there were very few people that I met that I was like, oh man, this dude is not intelligent at all. Most people either had a bachelor's or just tons of experience, were extremely intelligent, well-read. It, it was insane. I mean, there were people that were cracking open war and peace for fun, you know? So I'm <laughs> like, wow, okay. Like, like it totally changes your, your perspective when you're around that caliber of person. And let's be honest, if we're going to be running like a multi-billion dollar industry, because that's what the military is, do you really want it run by people who aren't at the top of their game? No, come on. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be what it is, you know? Yeah. And that's, yeah, exactly. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about advancement within the military? (laughs) Yeah, I can. I didn't advance too far. I ended up leaving the military as a specialist. I got in a lot of trouble throughout my career. I did a lot of bad things. Not saying that I left with like a dishonorable discharge. I left with an honorable. I never did anything like super bad. Um, but like I said, I wasn't really keen on authority. And there were times that I knew I should have shut up and I didn't. So I think advancement does, there's a certain piece of it where you do have to check the block, so to speak, right? You know, you have to do the courses, look good in the uniform, work out, do those things. Like those are all important aspects of it. I wouldn't say it's all of it because I was very technically proficient. Um, just basic soldiering was not really my strong point. Right. And I'm not going to say that it was, I mean, I had a friend of mine who he works with special operations now and he was, you know, we used to, there's a joking term in the military called board babies, right? They're people who look perfect, you know, go in front of the boards, have that mindset and everything else. And, you know, honestly, that was, that was just kind of how it was. There were just different groups. There were people that met it and people that didn't. And I think, for me, that that wasn't me, but also you need to have that proficiency and that all well-roundedness, just like anywhere else, right? And now that I'm outside of the military, I definitely appreciate the need for well-roundedness. I think in the military, I didn't really respect it as much as I do now. So yeah, to advance, you have to understand all of those pieces. It's so perfect that you mentioned being well-rounded as your child is pounding on the door in the background. <laughs> Beautiful. That was that. I mean... That was the cherry on the top of your point right there. It really was. It really was. I want to ask, there are some people who are anti-military, anti-violence, or both. And I want to know, what are some of the things that the military accomplishes during peacetime? Yeah. So I wasn't really a peacetime soldier. (laughs) I did a lot of deployments. But it's funny because I will say this, having done all of that, I'm not really pro-violence. And I think a lot of people, once you've seen war, you don't really want to be a violent person. Like, I mean, there's your small category, but truthfully, yeah, I'm kind of over violence. Um, That doesn't mean, you know, I'm kind of that, you know, it's better to be a samurai in a garden, Mm -hmm. be a gardener in a time of war. And so that's kind of me. Like, I don't want to fight. Um, I know how to, and I, and I will, right. If you challenge certain core things that are in my, the fiber of my being, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, I'm not pro-war. And I think a lot of people are pro-violence or pro-war even. I understand that there's a need for it and it has its place. And I, and I served in a time of war, deployed to multiple war zones. But yeah, I think for a lot of military, you don't really want to be that violent person. And then secondly, you, you learn how, but it's not something you actively seek out. You respond in kind when you have to, right? Because just not every situation that I was in, was a war fighting scenario, right? Like not every time did I go out, did we get into a gunfight or something like that. And I think that in peacetime, there is so much that they're doing, right? If you just see on TV when, when natural disasters hit, or now the talk of military helping to move the vaccine when COVID, you know? And so there's a lot of things that the military does. And then along with that, um, the military kind of builds up the future, right? A lot of people getting out of the military move into businesses, move into starting their own business, things like that. So the things that you're learning in the military, those leadership skills, you know, training soldiers underneath you, responding to soldiers above you, right? Like 
you learn all these different skills that then serve you in the future. So I think even outside of a war, people are learning those core leadership, core lifestyle, core, you know, just business traits that you need to have. And you're learning, you're learning it in one of the largest organizations there is, right? So you're learning it in a very complex environment as well. Uh, A lot of parents are, well, I don't know if it's a lot or if it's just some, but there are a number of parents who fear having their child join the military because they're afraid their child's going to be put into danger or in a hot zone. But as you mentioned earlier, there's so much more to the military than just being a gunslinger and going into these hot zones. Can you talk about some of the other jobs that are, that are are available? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're doing certain forms of medical, you may never leave the States. You know, there's huge medical facilities that see tons of patients. So I live in San Antonio, right here in San Antonio, the hospital here, the the military hospital treats a lot of car accidents, um, highway accidents, drunk drivers, things like that, um, just because of how large and well-equipped they are, well-trained their staff is, right? So you could be in that form and never see combat. You could be illegal and, you know, be deployed, but never go outside of the wire, right? And you can be a photographer and never leave as well, right? So so there is all kinds of different things, but I think, yeah, it's not even, even if you are in a, in a war fighting scenario or a gunslinger job, right? It's not even a, a constant occurrence. I mean, I was an interrogator and that's quote unquote, the, the cool thing, right? You all, everyone has their stigmas and their ideas about what that is, but truthfully, yeah, you're not always war fighting. You're not always gunslinging. And, and like, I think if you look at the statistics, I think it's like 1% actually get into like gunfights in their career in the military, right? So it's a very small number or maybe maybe a little bit larger, right? But now since the war has kind of dwindled down, the numbers kind of balance back out. But yeah, I mean, not everyone's going to get shot at. Now, I will say personally, um, I'm not super stoked for my son to join the military. To me, I feel like I paid that debt and my son doesn't have to. Like I did it for my family. But, you know, I, I think that if your child really wants to do that, who are you to push them away from that? Because we spend our whole lives telling our kids they can be whatever they want, chase whatever their dreams they want. Should we let our own fears keep our child from doing what they feel to do? If a child comes to me and says, if my son comes to me and says, hey, I want to join the military. And his reason isn't because, well, I saw you do it, dad, and that was cool. If he has like a legit reasoning behind it, I would probably say, you know, I don't love it, but also I totally get it and I support it. And I want you to, to follow your dreams, follow your passions. Can you talk about the differences between enlisting, going into ROTC and going into R- OCS? And, and since I, I haven't said what those acronyms mean, do you mind explaining those for listeners who aren't you know, familiar with those acronyms? Yeah. So, you know, enlisted is just kind of your, it's not a lower class, but it's people who go directly into the army usually no college, things like that. A lot. So I will say usually because there are people who go to college and then enlist into the military. Um, OCS is going to be an officer, right? So if you have a degree and things like that, you can qualify to be an officer or you can go to school to be an officer, such schools such as West Point or the Air Force Academy, right? You'll go to school, then you'll do a term of enlistment. And so that's kind of the officer route. And then there's ROTC, which you could go either way, right? So you could, in high school, be interested in the military and decide, hey, I want to be enlisted or I want to be an officer. And you can kind of start seeing what that's like from a high school perspective. It's obviously very different, but it gives you an idea. So I did not do ROTC and I did not do officer. I was enlisted, but um, I knew a lot of people who went to ROTC and I knew a lot of people who were officers. And I knew a lot of people who had degrees and didn't want to be officers, right? So I think really and truly that is an individual choice. ROTC will give you an idea won't give you the full scale. You can enlist and your recruiter can send you to go tour a base earlier prior to that. Like you can see what it's like. So I think it's really kind of at the person's discretion. Like, what do you want to be? What do you want your career in the military to look like? For me, I just wanted to get out of where I was as quickly as possible. So that made enlisting being the best and most logical option for me, right? To get in as quickly as I could. ROTC wasn't really a program offered at my school. I think if it is offered at your school, it's kind of a good way to test the waters to see if it is something you're interested in. And even if you're not, it gives you something to put on a resume or a college application that kind of gives you a little bit of extra knowledge as you're first starting out. So I think it's I think it's good if it's if the military interests you, right? If it doesn't interest you, then there's no point in doing ROTC. You're not going to like it. And then the officer route. If you do ROTC and decide that 
that's not what you want to do, can are you still bound to fulfill a career in the military or are you able to back out of that? Ooh, I actually don't know because I didn't do it. Um, I think that you can. I don't think, I think it's kind of one of those you don't necessarily always sign on the line to be in. I'm not a thousand percent sure, but I don't think so. Well, I mean, if, if uh, one of our listeners is thinking about going down that route, then that would be a good question to ask the recruiter prior to getting yourself involved in all that. Oh yeah, I will definitely. Yes, I will say that. So always ask your recruiter. So if you can know what you want to do in the military, right? Like that helps a lot and it gives you more ground to fight for. Two, oh, don't hesitate to ask your recruiter questions. I didn't ask any questions because I just wanted to get out as quickly as possible. But yeah, I mean, you definitely, there's some value in asking recruiters questions and being involved with them and getting a clear understanding, just like anything else. You wouldn't just buy a car, right? Be like, oh, I want this car, right? You wouldn't ask any questions. You do your research online. Do your research when you talk to the recruiter, put all of that together, and it all comes together. And when it comes to enlistment bonuses, there is a list that they will have. And the bonuses change every year depending on what the needs are. So if they've got some spots that just are not filling up, they may attach a bonus to it to entice people to take that job. And so if you don't know what you want to do in the military, I would suggest, and you want a little extra cash, I would ask for that list. Like ask because the number is different. You were offered 10, 10 grand to be a human intelligence collector, but that number, it could be three grand. It could be, I don't know if it gets as high as 20 grand, but like those numbers fluctuate depending on the position. Yeah. There were some when the like cyber warfare and stuff was first kicking off, there were some pretty big bonuses to go into that. And I think that's kind of the thing, right? Like you just, if you don't know, and you just want to jump into something, sure, let the let the money drive you. But I think still have some interest or knowledge of that career, look it up. You know, you can even go to the Army website and, and see like each individual MOS and see what it is. Um, I will say for certain ones, like if you want to go down like the special operations camp pathway, or you want to go into um, like Rangers or something like that, then I think that's definitely a pathway that you need to really make sure that you get everything in writing because there's a lot of follow-on courses, right? So you'll go to basic and then you'll go 18X, right? Or whatever else. So for those, you really need to, and there's a lot of great people on social media who are in those fields who can kind of talk about what that's like. Just right off the top of my head, there's a guy on Instagram, Travis Raids, and he talks a lot about it, connects people with a lot of great people if they're looking into that option. So when you're going into more of those MOSs, you definitely want to make sure you look at the fine print because it gets really easy to get in. And then, you know, that course that you wanted didn't come up or, or whatever. But if you really book it out beforehand, you can make sure that you get everything. Oh, yeah. That is a huge piece of advice that every young person listening to this should grab onto and never let go is get everything in writing. It ain't policy. It ain't procedure. It ain't policy if it ain't written down. So it, there's so many stories where people say, oh yeah, my recruiter promised me the world on a magic carpet and you get there and none of those things that were promised to you comes to fruition because nothing was written down. You gotta like, it's a contract. When you join the military, you are still signing a contract. So make sure you know and understand what's in that contract. And if you are looking to get into special forces, then yeah, you gotta, you've got to get that stuff written down. Yeah. And I, and I will say like recruiters are not all bad, right? It gets real easy to give recruiters a bad name because they're trying to meet a quota, but they're not all bad. They're trying to, to put people in that they think best fit. And they're not trying to, to screw you over in an opportunity. They're trying to put you where they think would fit best. But truthfully, yeah, I mean, you just, you kind of have to do some of your own work. You can't expect someone to do it all for you. And that's true for anything in life, but definitely with the military. So let's, uh, I don't think we touched on the OCS route, which stands for Officer Candidate School. As far as leadership in the military is concerned, just because you don't go the the officer route, that doesn't mean you can't end up being a leader because you have the NCOs, which those are people who enlist and then become non-commissioned officers. Work their way up. Yeah. So it's kind of, so there's multiple routes. I mean, you can even go turn into a warrant officer, right? You can enlist and become an officer. You can switch over. It's called Green to Gold Program in the Army. So you can go from being enlisted to being a, a, a lieutenant, right? And and do that. Or you can be technically proficient at your job and become a warrant officer, right? It, it there To say 
if you don't know if you want to be an officer, that's not a decision you have to make at 18 years old, right? Like that's, is it definitely probably easier to make that decision? Sure. Right. Like anything else, the sooner, you know, the better, but like anything else, there's, there's room to grow, there's room to adapt and it might be a little more work, but you're able to do it. So officer candidate school is really, if you know, Hey, like I want to be an officer, I want to get my degree. I want to knock that out up front. Then yeah, go the officer candidate route. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, and there will be jokes, right? People will make jokes about officers. Bar bars. Like, I'll go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Lieutenants will get land nav jokes thrown like crazy and all of that. But at the end of the day, you know, they're doing it because they believe in it and they have a passion for why they went that route. Um, so I think as long as your your intentions are good, any route can serve you, right? If you care, like you can still, like you said, you can still be a leader inside of the enlisted corps. So you can become a, an NCO, deploy multiple times, and you get to train young soldiers. I mean, some of the best people, and I still talk to them today, are NCOs who took me under wing and taught me how to manage a checkbook, taught me how to balance my finances, taught me how to you know, not be an idiot. <laughs> so, so there's still room for leadership in, in any route you take in the military. And even me, when I was in the military as an E4, I was mentoring soldiers underneath me. I was you know, training soldiers in foreign countries. Like the leadership opportunities exist no matter what your rank, no matter what you do. If you show the technical proficiency and you show the desire to like anything else, just like in corporate, you have to show a desire. And it's okay if leadership is not your cup of tea. That's perfectly okay as well. You know, like just, just know that the option is out there if that's what you want. But if that's not what you're about, then no big deal, man. Life is whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Like there's leaders and followers and everything. So. So I just want to also throw in there that when you're 17, 18 years old, 19 years old, you don't have to make a decision today. You don't have to make a decision tomorrow. The military is still going to be there for you five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Do you know what the cutoff ages are for starting your military career? Ooh, I think it's somewhere in the 30s. I think it's late 30s. I think it's different for each branch. There's waivers for everything. There's waivers for everything. Like... They, if you really show the aptitude and you really want it, like they can waver and get you in, you know, I mean, they were doing it. I mean, I remember going to basic with a guy who had like two degrees, had his own business and he just wanted to join the military, he wanted to be enlisted. He wanted to experience it. And he was like, I don't know, like 38 or something like that. Oh, wow. He was like one of the oldest, like we called him dad. Oh, but like he was because because like he was he was right there with us getting smoked and everything. But he was he was probably older than some of the drill sergeants that were coming at him. Right. So, I mean, it's just there's a way where there's a will, there's a way. And I think that's really the key to it, just like anything else in life. If you really want it, then, yeah, sure. Like you can get it. There might be a waiver. There may be extra things. You may have some fitness stuff you have to knock out. But, yeah, there's a way. So I won't really ask you about what basic training was like, because I'm sure just like for everybody, it's hell, it sucks. And if you want to, you know, get into the best physical shape of your life before you go, it's not a bad idea. But uh, I really want to know what is life like after basic training? Everybody is so wrapped up in the concept of basic training, but it means like, let's talk about what happens after that. That's that's an interesting question. Um, and one I don't get often. So yeah, let's see. So I really, for me, I did basic and then I went to, you go to AIT. So no matter who you are, you go to AIT, which is advanced individual training. So yeah, for me, that part was a lot more relaxed, right? You're not under the same strict rules that you were in in basic, but you're learning a new skill. I would consider it the closest similarity would be kind of like college you're going in and you're getting trained on this skill and depending on what it is determines like time and things like that. So for me, um, it was like six months getting advanced training, learning how to interrogate, going through courses, doing all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was really, it was just like, it was like school, but obviously you're in a uniform, you have like drill instructors still yelling at you and, and kind of keeping you in line. And they're still, they're making sure that the things they taught you in basic don't kind of go away. Right. So they're keeping that muscle memory fresh. And then, yeah, then I went to my first unit, got tons more training, right? You're always training. You're either deploying or training. And so I was training and then I was deploying, right? So I would train, deploy, come back, train people how to deploy, then deploy again, then take what I learned and train the next batch of people who were going out to deploy. And it was just a cycle. What was the best part about being a human intelligence collector? Oh, there were a lot. 
I enjoy it to this day. Like, and I'll even say, and I say it in a lot of podcasts, right? Because I basically talk about trauma on top of trauma, foster care to military, multiple deployments. I've lost tons of friends over the years, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was also fun. I think the brotherhood, obviously the camaraderie, like that part is always going to be top of the list, no matter. And I think no matter what your profession, but intelligence specific, I think for me, just the thousands of people that I've talked to, right? Like from military commanders, politicians, you know, Pentagon leaders, three letter agencies, right? Like CIA dudes and, and stuff like that. Like, it's just so cool. I mean, my first deployment, I was getting to roll around in an up armored Mercedes Benz, like at, at 18, at 19, well, 19, I was only at 19 at the time, 19 years old. Like I was doing that, you know, and it was super fun. So I think that just, just, and the, just the sheer conversations, right. Talking to people who had served, you know, in Saddam's regi- regime, right. Like inside of Royal guards or, you know, and Kurds force or pushing out, you know, talking to these villages after we push Al Qaeda out and talking and seeing what that's like. And when ISIS kicked off, some of the, fun- the initial leaders were people that, we had been chasing when I was in Iraq at the time. Right. So it's just kind of cool to be a part of history, not just see it and read it in a book. After you push out Al Qaeda from some of those villages, what was it like interacting with those people? Yeah, it was interesting. They were, you know, some were relieved, some were sad, right. Cause there was, that was a source of income for them. Right. Like everyone's got their own ideology and motivation. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was interesting, but again, everyone's got a story. And I think when you realize that, that it becomes a lot more fun and you kind of lose the judgment towards people's story. And you just say, you know, tell me your story. And that's kind of why in my own show, that's the question I lead off with is tell me your story because everyone's got their own story. And it took me thousands of interviews in tons of different countries to put it together and realize like, I may not agree with everything everyone says, but damn it, if I'm not going to be exposed to it. I love that. That is such a great mentality to have. I once dated a guy who was from Iraq and I think he had moved to the United States when he was about 14 years old. So like his childhood was out there. And he told me that they will kidnap and hold boys hostage, but they won't do the same for girls because they're not, because girls just aren't seen as valuable. They're not worth holding hostage because who's going to pay that ransom note? Did you see any kind of um, differences in ideologies between Western culture and the, what you saw out in the Middle East? Yeah. I mean, there's tons down to like the treatment of boys in, in Afghanistan. I don't know how vivid I can get on this podcast. So I'll PG it. But essentially they had like these boys and they would call them Bachabazi boys. And they're just like T boys. Right. But these were like boys that they would sexually exploit and stuff like that. And it's, it's just different. Like it's not really, it's not really condemned there. It is, but it isn't. It's like this very taboo, but not taboo. And it's so weird. And especially navigating that as a person, so for me, like I was in foster care, right? An abusive foster home. So seeing that happen to children was really awful for me to see. And it wasn't, and it definitely added to my trauma, but it, it just, it was hard to fathom, right? That, that the same military commander that we would work with for something would be that kind of a person, right? And, but they would sexually exploit the boys for like the, the, the United States soldiers. No, 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 no. Like they were Afghan soldiers uh, and they would kind of do, do that kind of that whole thing on their own. And, but then, but then like, it was just kind of common in the culture overall. Right. So the Taliban would do it as well. And there were boys who would be exploited that we could then, that we ended up getting information from because they were just traumatized and wanted away from that lifestyle. Right. But then just how we could exploit them and get information from them. The Taliban can do the same thing, right? So if you're being sexually exploited by a police chief and the Taliban says, hey, strap this bomb to your chest and you can get payback for all the people who hurt you, kind of sounds a little appealing to a traumatized child, right? So in some days, it, it, it was almost like a lose-lose battle. But yeah, I mean, that was one really key difference that I still can't wrap my head around. I, I just can't condone abuse of children in any way, shape, or fashion. And I think 2020 has kind of really put some of that in the forefront, which I'm glad. And I think 
that was a weird piece. Definitely the value of women was definitely really weird out there, you know, down to, you know, willing to trade goats and stuff like that. And just very, especially when you get into like the more rural, like mountain areas, like I was in Bamyan for a little bit. Bamyan's very rural. Um, when the snows hit, the one road will close up, right? So you you have to have everything you need before that point. So yeah, it's definitely a very different culture. Like there's no other way to say it. It's different. But then just like there's weird pieces like that, there's like Pashtun Wali, right? Which is like a code of ethics where, you know, they won't let someone be hurt who's by themselves, right? Or they'll stick up for certain people or do certain things. So it's definitely a different culture. Um, it's one that I got to be immersed in. So I took the immersion course in the military that was run by a bunch of CIA people, DIA, like people who had experienced it, been a part of it, helped kind of do some of the initial trades when we were doing like buybacks in Afghanistan uh, and stuff like that. And they built a course to kind of show you what it was like to live in the Afghan culture. Uh, then, you know, we would get immersed in it with when we would go there ourselves. So just like there's bad things in our culture, there's bad things in theirs. There's bad things in their history, just like there's bad things in ours. And I think that's really the key point. Like we try to put ourselves as America on this high moral horse. And I'm not going to say that America is not the greatest country in the world because I thousand percent believe that. But 200 years ago, we were burning witches at the stake, right? Or hanging them or drowning them, right? So we, we, we say like, oh, this country is so barbaric or this is so that. But really and truly, we were that way 200 years ago. So is it really that different? As you were telling your story about the boys that were being sexually exploited in Afghanistan and Iraq, I was going to mention that we can't pretend like that kind of thing doesn't happen here in the United States as well. And I agree. I think 2020 has brought a lot of issues to light. And you know that phrase people say like, oh, this thing just happened? Come on, people. It's 2017. It's 2019. Come on. It's 2020. Like, yeah, we are supposedly far more advanced at this point, socially, politically, economically. But at the same time, there's so many flaws in like our justice system and in the immigration system, like there's flaws everywhere. So if you are someone who, if you're struggling to find purpose in your life, look for those flaws and look to see how you can contribute to the solution. But yeah, I mean, even like there's some barbaric stuff that happens today in the United States and it's unfortunate. Like I also agree this is such a great country, but at the same time, I want to see improvements everywhere. So getting back to interrogation, you mentioned that you gathered information from even from these boys that were sexually exploited. What is that like? Yeah. So, you know, everyone's got this misconception. I'm going to go ahead and dispel it right now. Right. You, you watch Zero Dark Thirty and you do all of that and you think, oh, man, like interrogators just waterboard people and pull off fingernails and tie people up to batteries and electrocute the shit out of them. That's that's not realistic. Like it's just not. And for, for perspective, go into your office and punch somebody in the face and then ask them a question and tell me what happens, right? Like probably not going to be a good outcome nine times out of 10 because human fight or flight. But the main point being is interrogations are conversations. It's this right here. It's getting to know somebody, understanding what makes them tick, understanding what they're afraid of, what their likes and dislikes are. And then now, ultimately, you're using that to get to a goal of gathering information, right? But at the end of the day, it's it's a conversation, you know? And it definitely varies from the old Afghan male that you're going to talk to who has no respect for younger people because they're an elder and they're treated with respect to the, to the Taliban leader who is ideologically motivated and believes that you're a scourge in his country, right? And then down to, to the little boy who's just scared right? Like all of those involve a very different conversation that you have to have. And how do you have that conversation? Well, you have it by understanding the person that you're talking to. That was just going to be my next question is how does interrogation differ when you're doing it to children versus adults, men versus women, et cetera? Yeah. So, so I, I won't get too much into the actual trade craft, but there's like techniques and strategies and, you know, you can look it up online, you know, neuro-linguistic pathways and all that kind of stuff. But the point being is you just talk to somebody. The, the core of it is finding out what makes somebody tick and talking to them. 
You know, are they scared? Are they happy? Are they sad? What makes them feel that way? And what environment do they feel most comfortable talking to me, right? Like, how can I make them want to tell me something that they may not feel safe or comfortable talking about, right? Because, because I'm not over here asking you what your favorite color is. I'm saying, I want you to turn in your neighbor who's selling weapons for the Taliban. Like, that's a big ask of a lot of people. And like, even today, like, just think inside of America, if you know your next door neighbor, and then I say, hey, I got a report that says they're dealing heroin, right? Like, would you believe that? Would you would you be willing to? If you did believe that, how far would you go in telling me? Like, what you then get into that person's own individual ideology, right? Because there may be some people who know that a person's a criminal, but like, hey, that's not my business. I'm not going to talk about it. Or snitches get stitches, right? Or whatever other mindset you have, or you're you're the neighborhood watch who's like, I'm going to turn them all in, right? Like it, it all varies. And as an interrogator, the key is understanding that variety and saying, how can I have a conversation to get what I want for the person who's motivated by making their community safer? You know, it's pretty easy. Hey, by helping me, I can, I can make your community safer. For the person who doesn't want to talk, you know, you then have to find a way to make them feel comfortable talking to you. So I think it's, it's a mix. It's definitely... But at its core, it all comes down to listening, communication and talking, but then listening. Like it's not enough to just be able to talk because anybody can talk. But can you really listen to what that person's saying and then pivot the conversation based on what they're saying? Like if they say they're afraid, can you address that or are you just going to like breeze right over it? Is there a such thing as granting immunity? That's above my level. (laughs) So if there were people doing it, it definitely wasn't me. Like I wasn't granting anybody immunity. Gotcha. Well, I mean, like here we have like the witness protection program and you're right. And they do, obviously, like they have things like that. But, you know, as a as just an interrogator in the military, like I'm not the one making that kind of decision. Definitely not. There, there's people a lot higher up in the chain who I'm sure can. Right. Like I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. Um, it just wasn't something that I worked with. What's the difference between tactical and strategic interrogation? The, the main difference is just how exciting it is, I guess. No, no, that's that's a joke. But truthfully, tactical, it starts by breaking down the definitions, right? So tactical is on the objective, right? So let's just say hypothetical. It's what you see on TV. It's when people go to a house, blast in a door, and then start, you know, round people up and start asking questions. That's a tactical interrogation. We call it on the objective interrogation or a lot of other different names, right? On the X, things like that. And the key usually there is for follow on information to make sure that they're to continue the operation. Like, let's say you're doing a whole village, right? You're hitting houses throughout that entire village. If that's the case, you're definitely looking at, you know, trying to get some information, make sure that none of the other houses are booby trapped. Or if you are in a house, making sure that, you know, hey, is there anything that's going to get people if we go in here? Is there, you know, where are all the documents? Where are the weapons? What, whatever objective you went in there for, right? And if it's a high value person, you're trying to get as much information as you can to help the strategic interrogator, right? So so let's say you capture a high value target, you know, some key leader. You're going to want to try to talk to them to get as much information about their response, how they feel, how they acted, different things like that. So you can give the person who's strategic. So strategic is usually detention facility type interrogation. So people who are captured, And it's that long-term interrogation normally, you know, people who have been there for a very long time. Strategic tends to get the bad rap in the sense of places like Abu Ghraib and stuff like that. Uh, Truth be told, that, again, is not the majority of it. Most of it is conversation. I can tell you my best strategic interrogation was giving a guy a cheeseburger and letting him draw every time we talked. Like, again, it's conversation. So... But at that point, it, it's just longer term, right? It's somebody who's been incarcerated for a while. So the game's a little different. They know more. They've been a part of more. They've seen more. So it's definitely a different... They know just what you can and can't give, right? So like kind of what you just said, right? If I went in there and said, oh, I'm going to give you immunity, they're going to know you're full of crap, yeah. right? So it's it's stuff like that that's kind of... What, what you just said about giving a guy a cheeseburger and letting him draw every time you guys talked. That reminds me of that show, Mind Hunters. Have you heard of it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I actually it. watched some of it. Oh, them. I love that show. I need to finish it. My wife and I started it, and she was like, you're going to love this show. So I have a hard time watching shows like that. Yeah. And one of my favorites right now is actually Bull. I'm watching Bull, mm-hmm. and that's kind of 
close ish into into some of the world, right? Because a lot of person, you know, recognizing ticks and you know, basing character witnesses and different things like the way you communicate and stuff. But point being is that those things make it seem so simplistic. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I saw his eye do a micro expression. Yeah. The average person is not going to pick that up. I'm sorry. Like I can tell you, I can count on one hand the times I've picked up a micro expression. I'm not saying that there aren't people who can. Like there are people who specialize in that and that is their way to do it. For me, it was very much have the conversation, find the commonalities, get to that point, or in a tactical situation, try to ramp down the fear, right? Because most people, or anger, because most people just had their front door blown in. So how do I ramp that down to get them to a place where they feel comfortable talking? Like that was predominantly the way I ran. Take what you learned from today's expert and play. You heard me. Go play. Just try something new because that's the best way to discover your passion and purpose. If you found the episode insightful, give Industry Explorers a five-star rating and tell us what you learned in your review. Subscribe to Industry Explorers on YouTube for more adventures. Industry Explorers is made possible by the support and contributions from explorers like you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on our next adventure.